My name is Francine Blake. And what is your area of speciality, shall we say? I study crop circles. What brings you here to Megalithomania? I was invited. <laughs> I was invited to speak about the uh, inherent inner knowledge or ancient knowledge in the crop circle. The crop circle relating to the ancient monuments, and uh, they, you know, they are in the same areas. Crop circle always come near ancient monuments, so there is a relationship between the two. And this is what I was invited to explore. And do you um, do you think there's a correlation with what some call telluric energies? Absolutely, yes. That, that's a correct, yes. Could you tell me a little more about that? Well, I think that uh, most people understand that ancient monuments were placed on very special currents of energy and usually marking the, the, the most powerful spots, you know. That's where you had the, the best monuments, which were uh, usually on the most important uh, node of energy on the important lines, and the crop circles come around these areas. So we feel that, uh, it's my contention, that um, it not only has a geographical relationship, but it also has a relationship of meaning, that because we are near these ancient, these ancient monuments, very often we find that the information that is coming through the crop circle relates to ancient knowledge. And ancient knowledge is what gave birth to the ancient monument, of course, because whenever you you build a monument, you build according to your vision, according to your understanding of things, according to your knowledge, and therefore it is automatically encoded with an understanding. And that understanding is, uh, to me, very important for us to reconnect at the moment. And the crop circle, as I said, physically bring us right back to these monuments and often give us symbols that relate to the ancient knowledge. So we, it's creating a, a type of bridge between the two aspects, you see. When we see these sacred geometrical patterns mm -hmm. that emerge in crop circles, mm -hmm. what I'm getting at is, do you believe it to be um, a reflection of inherent geometric patterns in the Earth grid, if you like, mm -hmm. or do you believe there's intelligence behind it? It's not automatic, really. It's not inherent. Well, although in nature you have inherent patterns, uh, the crop circle are clearly giving us ancient knowledge, and you, you can clearly see that, you know. It is not just a natural pattern, a, geom a natural geometric pattern. It, uh, it can relate to mathematics, it can relate to uh, quantum physics, it can relate to all sorts of, of subjects, as well as bringing back some really well-known ancient uh, symbols, ancient symbology that we can recognize. So I wouldn't say that it is an automatic thing, no, I wouldn't. I would say that it's conscious. There is a consciousness behind it. And do you think that the ancient monuments, um, the ancient megalithic sites, yeah. Uh, near where too many of these crop circles are discovered. Do you, do, it's a kind of a chicken and egg situation, isn't it? Do you think the monuments are attracting the energies, or do you think the monuments were built in recognition that that's where the energies collect? I believe that they were built in recognition that's where the energy was. It's your view then that the ancient sites were built to mark, enhance, or to uh, acknowledge the ancient energies that have been discovered there? I think so. Uh, from, uh, from knowing indigenous people who recognize and can sense this energy, uh, they would, if they had to build a sacred place to, to, to revere the planet or whatever, they would choose an area where the energy is strong, is propitious for that kind of uh, um, exercise, you know. And it, because it feeds, it, it feeds us. We go there. We go to a sacred site. It's we feel good. There's a guy, nice energy. It feeds us. It puts us into a meditative state, and uh, we are able to ponder and to understand things better. So it elevates the spirit. We can sense that readily. The indigenous people and our ancestors were indigenous people. They were not removed from the earth the way we are in a way. In the men, they were not in the mental. They were in a feeling. So they chose these places and a stronger the energy, the bigger, the monument, the more important the monument. So you would have this like a difference between a little church and a cathedral. You know, it might put a little church with a bit of energy, but where there is a, cr a crossing of powerful lines of energy, they would mark it with a, 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 an imposing 
monument, which will at the same time enhance that energy. Because in fact, the, uh, certainly in the Egyptian tradition, the architect were, were people who had been trained as, as the uh, spiritual guide, you know, they were like the, um, they were the monks, they had been trained in a spiritual understanding and they were, they were in charge of building the monument so that it would enhance the area. They understood this, this kind of knowledge. So this is my viewpoint. Mm. I, I think that's echoed across the board, in fact, particularly with the Egyptian culture, which I, I, I've looked at myself, um, mm -hmm. that there does seem to be this holistic approach to, uh, if, if I can use the, the, the term left and bright, right mm -hmm. brain mm -hmm. for the same subject. So astronomy and astrology are mm -hmm. not disconnected. Mm -hmm. um, architects and priests are. Yeah, of, of, of that's the same. right. And that's so it's right. an acknowledgement of the, of, the, of the spiritual component in... Yes. in and metaphysics in physical aspects. Yes, that's right, that's right. Um, why do you suppose that these ancient sites continue to have such an effect on modern people? There's more and more people becoming interested in these kind of things, aren't there? The ancient sites are built on the lines of energies, and the lines of energies, uh, in fact, contain the knowledge. It's a kind, kind of consciousness of the earth, if you so, if you so that means it's the, the, the earth herself, her consciousness. So where there is a crossing of these big, I mean, you have different types of lines of energy. You have the big, um, go, uh, the big, um, anyway, so the biggest, the current, the bigger the current, a pet, particularly if you've got two arteries, let's use the word artery. Yes. So we've got arteries, we've got veins, we've got capillaries in our own system. So the main energy goes into the, uh, in, into the, uh, into the uh, arteries. Is that's why it's really pumping. And then you've got the vein, where well, the current isn't quite so strong. And you've got the capillaries, well, it's, it's not very strong. So where do you have the, 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 the condensed power? Well, you'd have in the big organs, like the heart and so on, where all the, you know, the, um, the, the, the blood flow goes. It's the same in the planet. The planet, seeing it from indigenous viewpoint, they see it as a. They see the planet as a living being, a good, great goddess, and that great goddess has major arteries, major, and then it's got rivers and it's got so on and so forth. So, in a place like Avebury, where you have major arteries of the planet crossing, path, they would put a very important temple. You see, and people would be attracted because the temple enhances that energy, it gives it form, and it sort of taps into it, it encloses it. So when we go there, we sense it. That's why there are thousands of people who go to Stonehenge. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and you go to Avery, and you go to Machu Picchu, and all these places. These are the, the great ancient temples. This is where we find crop circles. The crop circles come around these major points of energy on the planet. It's not just in England. I was. Uh, telephoned by some people, I know some shamans in Peru, and they said they had one near Cusco. Suddenly they had a crop circle that arrived right next to Cusco. Is this recently? Yes, recently, a few months ago. And would you say there's an increase in the incidence of crop circles? Yes, I think that it is, well, it's been going on for 30 years, it's very intense, and we've had, you know, several thousands of those, but it is in increasing in the sense that the uh, the design are much more meaningful and much more profound, you know. I feel that um, at first it was almost incidental. In fact, at first they were not noticed uh, particularly, you know, they were little circles, the simple circles. And then as soon as they began to be noticed, um, we discovered that um, they were amazing. And even, you know, in 1980, a, a circle with a ring and uh, Little little circles around it is was absolutely phenomenal. It was blew their to blew their mind completely. No. I feel that there is an interaction between the consciousness who sends these things and and ourselves. People felt that even when they were simple circles, they felt there was a kind of progression, you know, and the things were growing and were getting more complex. It is getting more and more complex. It's very complex now, and it's completely into the, the symbolic aspect. You know, it's very symbolic, and it's symbolic from every tradition that's ever existed on this planet. And most traditions are, are understand them better than ours, than the white person, you know, because we're so uh, materialistic in our viewpoint, whereas they see the symbol directly. 
and they recognize it from the from the particular angle from that particular tradition I need to ask the question yeah as devil's advocate that's fine um, what about the hoaxes yeah what about the hoaxes uh, we've had several thousand crop circles in the same area which is within about the 12 mile radius of Avebury so it's quite a small area it is every year in the same locations very often the same field not infrequently bang on top of the one the previous years where you can still see the traces you know year after year and um, therefore the contention that um, it could be made by teams of people. Now, if you just think that there are hundreds and hundreds of people who come to visit the crop circle in the summer, many people watch at night because everyone wants to see one happening. In fact, if you go out at night, it's full of people. You see them everywhere. It's never seen. We've never seen a team of people making a crop circle, unless it's done by the television or another body, and there's two or three of those every summer, and we see them every time. But the idea that 60, between 60 and 80, could uh, crop circle could have been constructed over a period of 30 years without anybody ever seeing anything onwards in the pouring rain, very often it happens in the worst downpour imaginable, in the, in the mist and so on, without anyone ever knowing anything, is not is not really realistic. Do you know what I mean? And um, a farmer said to us, you know, he's had 125 on his land, and he said, if it was man-made, I would know it. Mm. They would slip somewhere, you know. They would use lights. We would see them because there's never any lights. The man-made one used lights overnight. Mm. The others appear in complete darkness, in com fog often, pouring rain, it doesn't matter, it appears. So that is just from a point of view of common sense. I often say to people in the countryside, everybody knows everything, you know. And I often say to people, you can have an affair in London, nobody will know. In the countryside, everything gets known. So if you have teams, 30 years, making these things every night, all the time, 60 to 80, every summer, something would have happened. It would have, you know, something would have slipped. They would have slipped somewhere. We're not superhuman. This is the human. Now, that's, that's one aspect. That's just the common sense aspect. The other aspect is that we're not so stupid, the people who study this. And very early on, we cottoned on that, wait a minute, we see that the, when we go into the crop circle, that the, the, the wheat actually looks quite different from the one outside. It's got nodes that is uh, bent, and you, often you look at it and you find fissures on the, on the, uh, in the node in particular, in particular, that looks quite dramatic compared to the, the, the rest of the field. It's completely different. I mean, you can see it with the naked eye. So from the 1991 or 1990, we started to collect uh, samples of wheat and have them analyzed in laboratories. And uh, our group, uh, the group that I've um, established in 1995, the, the Wiltshire Crop Circle Study Group, we actually spent several summers collecting the, the seeds and the earth to be analyzed in laboratory. And we were given a protocol to follow. We had to follow something very strict, and we had to take measurements. It would take two or three days with a good team to collect sufficient, you know, samples to to, to be analyzed in, in uh, by 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 specialists in laboratories. And we would have to go up to 300 feet outside the formation, and it's very involved. And it takes us a long time, and we did that. We we've got many many uh, results from laboratory. We also had to collect soil. And the soil we sent to ADAS. And I don't know if you know what ADAS is. You know DEFRA. Well, before DEFRA, it was called ADAS. It's only 10 years it's been called DEFRA. So it's actually the laboratory that belonged to the government. And it's for the uh, Department of Agriculture. And every farmer in the country, if is, is, is concerned about his wheat or the condition of the soil, would send, will send that to be analyzed to find out if there's a disease or whatever. And then they go and look to the microscope and so on. They do analysis. So we send them the, um, the soil. We send them soil samples because the rest was analyzed in America. There's a laboratory there that's been very useful. 
and we send them soil samples from various um, crop circles around the country. And knowing, of course, that whenever you say crop circle to people, they immediately see hoaxes. We, you know, we know that. It's, it affects your judgment. If you're presented with uh, soil and you have that vision in your mind, it affects your, your, your judgment. So we did mention that they were, we just said, this is the field at Beckhampton, this is the northeast of the field, this is, you draw, you draw the field, you see, this is the area we want you to analyze. And we take samples up to 300 feet away from the design, and we've had samples going down, you see. And what they find in every case, except some, some were done specifically to try to test the system, and, you know, immediately they can tell there's no effect on the plants. But they, they, what they find is that Usually, the center point in the middle is the most part, is the most affected, and then in the formation, right up to the edge of formation, is affected, and then it starts to decrease. And the further out you go, the the the, 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 the lighter the imprint is. Some formation were covered the whole field and went e went even in the next field. You know, the one at Stonehenge in 1996, went uh, the the uh, energy went all the way at to 300 feet outside the design. And <coughs> what were the results of the testing? Well, the results is that the uh, center of the, uh, the the result is that the plant shows signs of having been heated from the inside, with an energy that is very uh, that produces a lot of electric a lot of heat. You see. And at, to a point that uh, very often it makes the sap boil and the sap ex escapes, becomes steam and it es escapes through the nodes and you get fissures, you get cavities there, which you can see with the naked eye often. You know, I, I see ev in every crop circle I go, I see those. I check that all the time. So they say that it is being hit very rapidly. It's a, it's a burst of heat because it's such a powerful heat to turn the sap into steam would mean that it fit hung around for any time, especially when it come at the end of the summer and you're looking at straw, which is completely dry, you would, you know, it would ignite. So it's a very, very thing, it's a, it's a fraction of a second, actually, the process is very rapid. That's the, what you see on the plant. So the, the, the inference then is that, that the entire crop circle appears in, in an instant? It does, it appears wow. extremely rapidly. Because that's, that's, I, I, this is new to me. Um, tell me something. But hang on, I haven't Sorry. finished with okay, this. Okay, I beg your pardon. <laughs> because this is very important, because people don't know that. So, um, therefore, scientists are uh, of the agreement that it happens very quickly, otherwise it would ignite, especially in August, when it's, you're actually dealing with straw, you know. Now, in the soil, um, I... Uh, discussed this with the head scientist, he, I rang him specifically and I was in, in, in contact with him when he was doing the analysis. He says that they were absolutely shocked. So they didn't know that they were, ana uh, that they were looking at, um, at earth or soil that was from a crop circle. They were just asked to analyze the soil objectively. And they, they saw, because we have to send them, you know, a drawing of the area and so on. And they would tell us, right, and the, the point of impact, the soil was so completely changed that he told me it was as if it had been hit directly by a bolt of lightning. Such was the power of the impact in the soil. It changed the composition of the soil in the whole area of the crop circle, and sometimes it goes be beyond it, you see. And was the soil made more fertile or less? Fertile? It's more fertile, it's more fertile, because if you get a bolt of lightning in the soil, it fertilizes the, la the land. In fact, without electrical storms, the land would, be, uh, would not be fertile. It brings fertility, it creates fertility into the soil. Wow, okay. Yeah. So, um, Another thing that um, they found in America is that sometimes when we send the samples, in the samples, they find silica, crystals of silica, which doesn't exist outside in the field. And to create silica from Earth requires enormous power. It requires either the passage of a glacier, 
a huge pressure, you know, over th millions of years that goes across the, well, not maybe million, but a long time goes across the land, will create silica just by the sheer pressure or an input of heat. I can't remember exactly how hot it has to be, but it has to be as hot as a direct bolt of lightning. <laughs> you see what I mean? And that's thousands of degrees. So that soil shows scientifically signs of having been received, having received a very, very quick burst of heat that completely changes composition. Of extreme energy, absolutely. Yeah, and um, the year after year, you see, obviously, the farmer's cut his thing, he, 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 um, he um, turns the soil and so on, and then he replants, and we see that the plants look different, and I've been told by a farmer, and he said that uh, on his land, he's had, you know, he's had many, he's had over 80, he said, what I find the most difficult is wherever I had a crop circle, the plants never grow the same. Well, they're better. They're taller, they're thicker, they're different. You know, they never grow the same, which causes a bit of problem with the, with the machine, of course, you know. And uh, they, they see that. We can see that from the air. We can see shadows from previous years where the, the crop circle was. We can, we can tell. That's why we know that sometimes they come, they overlap the same place. I wanted to talk a little bit about this 30-year this, um, benchmark. You referred to it a couple of times. Um, what year are we actually talking about? Is it 1980? The, yes, 1980 was the time when the uh, people started to notice them because the crop circles, are, they are reports throughout history. You that know. was what I was going to ask you. Yeah. It's, it's, is it more a case of we've just started noticing them yes. rather than they've just started to appear? Yes, it okay. is a case of that. And what's the earliest recorded... Uh, reporting of a crop circle that you know about? Well, some people have gone back and said the Sumerians were talking about, you know, the designs in the field and so on. Certainly, apparently, it is mentioned in the Vedas, in some of the Vedas, in and India. they said in India, yeah. that uh, really before our era, uh, there is mention that signs were appearing in the, in the grass, in the fields. Uh, indigenous people, the Hopi, uh, were, were saying also that whenever there's a change of cycle, signs appear on the planet to give us the knowledge and when we went to see i wasn't there personally but there was a group of people who went to see them and show them the crop circle they said you know we're at the end of a long era now and signs are coming on the planet and they remembered the previous occasion and they still had the the design of the previous ones you see we've noticed all over um, the world in, in uh, megalithic sites from the americas to africa to europe um, many similarities, um, particularly in terms not only of the construction style, but their alignments to the stars, mm -hmm. the moon, the mm -hmm. sun. Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose these were so important to the builders? Mm. Well, every tradition, ancient tradition that I know of, including the Veda, the Indian, and uh, any spiritual tradition will say that the knowledge was much higher. Always, the further back you go, the higher knowledge, the knowledge was. And that knowledge goes up and down, and depending on the influence from the heavens. And they understood the influence from the heavens, and I think that's why they were so keen to, uh, to, to know what was happening in the heaven and to follow, because the, heaven, the movement of the, system, the solar system in the galaxy the galaxy, the, the, the solar system travels in the galaxy and is subject to different influence, just like we are. If we travel in the world, we go to France, it's different from Yugoslavia or from Germany or so on. There's a different influence. It's the same in the heaven. But depending where you are, you get the different energies that are coming, and that affects the Earth. It affects the whole system, the solar system, in fact, effectively. And the ancients saw that this big procession of the planet of 26,000 years, they called it the Great Year. It's not just the Mayan who had that uh, information, the Chinese had it, but also the Europeans had it. And it was called, it's an ancient tradition, it was called the Great Year. And they saw the Great Year as being divided into four seasons. And therefore, as the same thing as happens on the Earth, you got four seasons. They're completely different. You live differently, you feel differently, the Earth behaves differently. And therefore, it's the same. If you've got that long year, you have a spring which is 
very propitious to knowledge, everything grows, wonderful civilization. Summer, it blossoms completely. Autumn comes, oh, it starts to get a bit cold and things start to degenerate. And winter, you're really in the doldrums. And it's called the dark, the, you know, it's the dark part of the, of the last, pa last part of the procession. Um, and the, the Indian called it the Kali Yuga, the, the time of, of iron. And when we are in winter, knowledge disappears, goes really low. And we are coming out of winter now. And it's not that we don't have knowledge. We have knowledge, but we have a mechanical knowledge. We don't have a knowledge of life and, and spirit and how things can blossom. So that knowledge now is coming to an end, really, that mechanical knowledge. is We're coming to a point where if we continue with it, we destroy the earth. So it's either we start to look at life and we start to regain the knowledge of spirit and make a world that is propitious to life, or we carry on with our bloody-mindedness and we completely destroy the planet and therefore ourselves. And that's always a danger, and that's what happens every time. According to the indigenous, they say that at the end of every of these great circles, it is as if humankind is trying to destroy the planet. Um. One of the things that seems to be emerging for, for many researchers um, and indeed aspects of orthodox um, study, orthodox archaeology, um, is the notion that many of these monuments um, seem to be significantly older than we're told. Yes, I agree with that. Why do you suppose that the orthodox continues to cling so rigidly to the, to the current uh, chronology? Another thing that happens in the time of iron is we lose our memories. We've lost the memory of the ancient time. It's been kept on the ground for, for thousands of years, you know. People have kept that knowledge. It's called esoteric knowledge. It's a knowledge that's been kept hidden. It's coming out now. It's just resurfacing. And we begin to see things in a different way. But, no, but uh, uh, belief is a strange thing. Belief, people, when they have a belief, they confuse it with reality. So if you have a mechanistic belief, you think that is all that exists, and that is equal to, to materiality, and there is no other option. And we, often, we have often made that mistake, the human race. So you continue, you don't want, because if something comes along that, uh, you know, for example, the monument, and people are frightened of the monument here, you know, and they, they, they don't like going back in time, you know, it's, it's difficult. So what happens is that confronted with something that does not tally, does not resonate with your belief, it threatens you because you confuse belief with reality. So suddenly you don't know how, you, it, it, it's threatening. It's a, it's, a threat, it's a threat, you see. And that's why they're hanging on so much. They don't want to let go. But that happens every time. It's not the first time that it happens. It's always the same pattern. I think we've about covered it. Yeah. Francine Blake, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Megalithomaniac.